Genesis 15 may be uh, not only the richest, fullest chapter in all the book of Genesis, but one could argue that it is the fullest, richest chapter in all of the scripture. It is in Genesis chapter 15 that God comes again to Abraham, speaks with Abraham, and makes covenant with Abraham. If you remember from Genesis 14, uh, Abram and his uh, servants went and uh, rescued Lot and his uh, wealth and then ran into Melchizedek, and we spoke about that great mystery. And then Genesis 15 begins after these things, that is the things that we talked about last time, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. And Abram, of course, then responds with great praise and thanksgiving at the certainty that God has given him of blessing. No, that's not exactly what happened. Instead, Abraham, I, I assume we don't, aren't really given a hint as to his uh, tone or his manner, but I assume with some level of trepidation and hopefully some sign of giving honor, but essentially he complains and says, uh, you know, all those promises you gave me earlier, um, being a blessing to the nations, having a nation come from me, uh, I don't even have a son yet. I'm old. And if I died tomorrow, uh, one of my servants, Eliezer, would be my heir. So, you know, you've made promises before and they haven't come to pass. Well, God was gracious and patient and kind and forgiving. And in fact, he was still more. But we'll get to that in just a little bit. First, God corrects Abram. Behold, you... Oh, see, that's Abram. Uh, the Lord said to him, This man shall not be your heir, that is Eliezer. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought them outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. We'll stop there. One of the things that I try to encourage people to remember when we read the Bible, and I, I've probably beaten this drum uh, in this context already, is to remember that this is true, that this is history, that this conversation actually happened, that Abraham was a real man. Just like you. And, he, and God told him, go outside and look at the stars. And he said, now, if you can count those, you'll be able to count your seed. God made covenant. And that covenant, like every covenant that God has made, still abides. It hasn't disappeared. Here's what I want you to understand. You, if you are in Christ, are literally fulfillment of prophecy. You, if you are in Christ, represent one of those stars, one of those sands upon the sea, one of those things that Abraham cherished in his heart. You are the answer to his prayer. Abraham is the father of the faithful. And if we are blessed with the gift of faith in Christ, then we are Abraham's children. I think about that again in the context of my own people. My ancestors hail from the British Isles. And I, I, you may be familiar with a, a little bit of history that that when the Roman Empire was expanding and and virtually covering the earth, first uh, securing authority over all around the uh, uh, Mediterranean Sea, and then they moved eastward from there, but they also moved westward all the way across France, across Europe, across the North Sea, and into the British Isles. And they were doing great. And they're thinking to themselves, hey, we pretty well conquered the world here. And they got to the northern part of Great Britain. And there was a wall there. It's called Hadrian's Wall that separated England from Scotland. 
and the Roman soldiers looked over Hadrian's wall and they saw my ancestors, raw savages, naked, dressed in blue, worshiping trees, raw savages hooting and hollering. And the Roman soldiers said, you know what? <laughs> we are so far out there in the corner of the world that even if we don't conquer those people up there, we can still be considered a, a world empire. We'll just leave those crazy people alone. They would not cross Hadrian's Wall and they did not conquer my people. But then, after the fall of the Roman Empire, another group of soldiers wanting to see all of the world brought under subjection of their king came to that same spot at Hadrian's Wall. And they looked over and just like the Romans saw, they saw my ancestors, raw savages, naked, painted, hooting and hollering and screaming. And the soldiers in this army crossed over Hadrian's Wall and went into Scotland. And they knocked my people down, slayed them with the word of God, pierced their souls with the gospel. And all of this, when the Christian missionaries with more courage than the Roman soldiers who crossed over and proclaimed the rule of Christ brought my people in. And that story's been repeated all around the globe because of the sureness of God's promise to Abraham. Well, having said that, text says, Abram believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. This is another one of those places where we meet the gospel in a less developed form, less clarity. What did he believe? Well, he believed the promises of God. He believed in God's deliverance. Did he believe that God would take on flesh and dwell among us? That he'd be born in Bethlehem? That he would live a perfect life? That he would be hung from a tree? That he would be cursed for us? And that he would raise again from the third day? No, he didn't believe all that. He didn't know all that. He did know his dependence upon God's grace. Abram believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. This is repeated in Romans by Paul to describe that process, which is true for us, true for them, true Old Testament, New Testament, at the end of the New Testament, into this age, always true. Back to the garden, to the end of time. The only way we all have peace with God is if we rest in the provision of Christ. Before he came, the saints looked forward to the coming of Christ. After he came, we looked backward to all that he has done. It's all one faith, one people, one family. We are the children of Abraham. Because like Abraham, we have been given the gift of faith and God calls us righteous. Well, the text doesn't end there. Just as God came and blessed Abraham after Abraham paid his tithe to Melchizedek, now Abraham, after he believes, receives this other blessing. Once again, he questions God, how shall I know that I shall possess it? God said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, and a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Do you remember this story? What is this all about? Having fulfilled God's command, as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. 
And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord God said to Abraham, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. And remember, Moses is telling this story to God's children while they're in the wilderness. They're hearing, that's us, that's us. He'll be afflicted for 400 years and I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve and they're remembering God's judgment and the miracles of the plagues. And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions and they're remembering all that they carried out of Egypt. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age and they shall come back here in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, and the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. What is this all about? What is this pot and this flaming torch? Why this cutting the animals in half? Well, you may not know this, some of you may, that the Hebrew word that we translate as covenant is berith and berith literally comes from the same root as a cutting just like a bris is a cutting berith means covenant it means cutting you cut a covenant and so as god called abram to take these animals and to split them in two he's giving Abram the opportunity to make covenant with God. He's saying, look, I'm, I'm covenanting with you. This isn't just a vision. This isn't just a promise. This is a covenant. And when covenants happen, there's got to be spilled blood. There's got to be animals sacrificed. There's got to be a cutting. None of that is surprising. You know, scholars have done research and discovered that so much of the, of the form of the covenants that we read about in Scripture actually reflect common cultural forms of covenant making in that day. What we call uh, ancient Near Eastern treaties or suzerain vassal treaties. That's what these covenants are like. If you look at the Ten Commandments, they follow that same pattern, a suzerain vassal uh, treaty, the suzerain, that is the superior one in the covenant, the, the, the king of the bigger kingdom, begins by introducing himself and reminding the lesser one of the grace that's already been shown. So in the Ten Commandments, it begins, I am the Lord your God. He's introducing himself. He brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bunch. I've already showed you kindness. I've already showed you grace. And now we're making covenant together. That's the method. That's the, the, the formula. And then it goes from there to uh, a, a giving of, of requirements on both sides and then sanctions on both sides. If I fail to do this, this is gonna, what, what's going to happen. If you fail to do uh, your part of the bargain, this is what's going to happen. And that's where these animals and this pot and this torch come in. See, Abraham is trying to preserve and to protect the covenant, in a sense, to fulfill it, as he's trying to drive these carrion birds away from these animals that have been split in two. But he fails, and he grows weary, and he falls asleep. There's darkness and dread. It's like Abram 
died. But the covenant isn't yet finished. It's not completed. In fact, it's not ratified. And that's why the pot and the torch come. And the pot and the torch go through these split animals. What's that all about? Here's what God's saying. Abram, I'm making covenant with you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to pour out my grace upon you. And I'm going to bless others through you. And the way you're going to know this is going to happen is not by your effort. And it's not by a threat to you. But if I don't keep this covenant, Abram, then may I be split in two like these animals. This pot, this torch represent God himself. And by going between these animals that have been split in two, God is saying, may I, who I am one, who, who can't die, who can't be divided. If I don't keep this promise, if I don't keep this covenant, if this covenant is not kept, then the immortal one will die. The indivisible one will be divided. That is how sure, Abram, you can be that this can come to pass. Because before this doesn't happen, I'll have to die. And one thing you know, Abram, is that cannot happen. But something like it happened. For the fulfillment of this covenant, Jesus did die. The God-man was put on the cross and his blood was shed. And through that, we become joint heirs with him, joint heirs with Abram. And all the promises that were given to him. Friends, God's promises are sure and they are certain and they cannot be undone. But more than that, they're overwhelming and their grace, and their scope, and their power. Abram, who has no children, God doesn't say, don't worry about it, you're going to have one. I promise you, you're going to have one. He's going to be great. No. He says, oh, you're worried about having a child? Here's what I want you to do, Abram. Let's step outside for a minute, shall we? Now look up at the sky. I don't know if you've ever had this experience. We were able to look into a sky without light pollution. It is a whole nother world. I was blessed to be, uh, spend a week on the Colorado River in the Grand Canyon and every night and there were no lights for miles and miles and miles around. I saw the stars in the fullness of their glory. And this it's not just, hey, Abraham, look how great and powerful I am. Look at these stars. He's saying, Abraham, every one of these is going to be like your child. You're going to have enough children to fill the sky like these stars fill the sky. That is the promise of God. And you and I are the fulfillment of that promise. And when God uses us to bring others into the kingdom, whether it's raising up our children or whether it's evangelizing to the lost, we are filling that sky and fulfilling the promise God made to the man, Abraham, who was all too real, all too flawed, but who, because he believed God, was counted as righteous.